and um, the idea of bringing, you know, they, they work in digital. The idea of bringing the digital to the physical world. How do you bring it to a gallery setting? And that's what we were trying to capture a little bit here. Um, uh, Tom did it with letterpress, <coughs> handset letterpress, and some of these other installations you'll see he can talk about. Brian did it with these really fascinating pieces, the halo behind his head. <laughs> <laughs> we planned it. You know. yeah. <laughs> His matching shoes. And the shoes yeah. Yeah. It all, it all <laughs> goes together. Yeah, he can, he can talk about how those were made. It's a really fascinating process. And John Odom, of course, made the uh, made interactive contraptions that we can elaborate on as well. So we'll keep it. If you guys have questions while the artists are talking, feel free to you know, raise your hand and interject. Um, we like to keep it casual. I want you to gain a little insight into what they were thinking and what we were thinking with the show as a whole. So with that, let's start with you. Okay, Jonathan, talk about your work a little bit and where you come from. What yeah, do do? Um, so I, uh, I don't know. I guess all these pieces at the end of the day, I, I make these things because um, they're things I have in my head that I want to see in the real world. And it's as simple as that. And it's why, why I do what I do. Um, where these particular things came from was a book I found at the... Uh, Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles. So have you been there? Yeah, um, yeah. It's a really cool place. And uh, they, this, this book is a, somebody reprinted it recently, but it's this, um, it's a, it's kind of a manual for machines made in the 1870s. So it's, you know, this, if this is this kind of gear, this is this kind of machine, whatever they, these things are used, this is used for farm equipment. This is used for a clock or whatever it is, but it's these, these beautiful little, you know, patent illustrations basically. And, and it's a taxonomy of, of machine parts. And the reason the guy made it was um, that, so there'd be an encyclopedia of this stuff that would help inventors come up with new things. So um, I kind of, my unrealistic goal after a while was to make all 507 of those mechanical movements. <laughs> so, so far I've got about five. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some time. Uh, Good damn project. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, that's what these are. Each, each one's named after the, the, the most important movement in, in each, um, each piece. Um, so that's that's kind of where it came from. On a on a more I don't know kind of philosophical art speaky level, it's it's also about um, our connection to technology and uh, the the disconnection we have now as modern people that that um, is something I think we kind of have to come to terms with. So um, you know we spend most of our lives with these things, and this is like. Uh, basically the, mo the monolith from 2001 Space Odyssey. It's, it's this little, you know, it's, it's full of stars, but it's this thing that we just don't understand at all. We have no connection whatsoever to how it's made or who makes it or what, you know, it's, it's all totally opaque. So transparent technology is something I'm really interested in. So, and there's also this interplay between, I, you know, I design all this stuff digitally and I use the, some of the newest tools we have as a civilization to, to make them, but, um, at the end of the day, they come back to these little, you know, overly complicated machines that do these really mundane, silly things like shoot <laughs> ping pong balls all over the floor or draw a sine wave on a piece of paper or something. Um, that I, I think there's there's something about that that might hopefully would would bring you to reflect a little bit on this the the miracle of modern civilization and all these amazing things that underpin all the stuff we just take for granted. Yeah, you know, it's very playful here. Yeah. So yeah. Like that. yeah. It's kind of like, what a, what a smart ass. Yeah. <laughs> but, but your approach is, is fascinating because you're not you're not trying to be steampunk about it. You're right. not trying to take old repurposed machinery. You're designing from scratch digitally. Yeah. And then three D printing. I think it's pretty fascinating. Oh, thanks, man. Do you want to mention what how what tools you actually use? Yeah. Um. So I I design everything in uh in Fusion three sixty. Mm -hmm. Um. I do work for Autodesk, so I'm, I, I kind of have to tell you that I use Fusion 360. <laughs> I actually do I use it for everything, but um, anyway, it's a, uh, yeah, it's uh, um, basically you, you come up with everything uh, as, a, as a 3D model first. Um, I can uh, test the machines and see how they actually work together and get a sense of what the range of motion mm -hmm. of things will be, that sort of thing. Um, then I use uh, a 3D printer. Um, in my landlord's garage. Th thanks, guys. Thanks for putting up for that. Up with that. Um, uh, that that prints all the little 3D plastic pieces, and then I've also used um, a laser cutter for a lot of these. So that's the flat panels that are made out of um, wood. Uh, and then there's also um, some some kind of uh, manufactured hardware in there too. That would just be too difficult for me to reproduce. So I kind of cheat that way. Yeah. 
What other kind of work do you do with, for Autodesk? What kind of uh, so for, for Autodesk, I'm kind of, um, I, I make content for them. Mm -hmm. That's that's sort of a, I don't know, kind of a tech speak thing. Basically mm -hmm. what I do is use their software to make stuff as a way of showing people the cool things you can do with their software. So. Cool. Um, a couple of these were projects that were, you know, kind of subsidized by them because they were paying me while I was making them. But um, uh, yeah, that mostly. I was an architect before that, like this guy, um, and yeah, now I mostly just kind of ma I make smaller things. Mm -hmm. And when I was an architect, I was always um, uh, I was always obsessed with details. So it's it's easy to uh, easy for me to kind of sink my teeth into stuff like this. And, yeah. You trained as an architect. Yeah, yeah, I, and I didn't. I never got my license, but I, I worked in firms for about for about five years, and, and then moved on moved on to this stuff because a, a door opened that I couldn't pass up. Nice, yeah. <laughs> very cool. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to him if you guys have any questions. Yeah, how about you, Brian? Uh, hi guys, um, my name is Brian Allen. Um, I also trained as an architect. I'm some sort of weird architect thing uh, now. Um, but in my day job is I make these things. Yeah. So um, I do know what's inside of them and how right. they're made you. and um, all that. But, um, and that's part of the reason why I make art yeah. is um, because I spend a lot of my day uh, working in CAD, working in a really dimensioned, very rigorous, um, rectilinear uh, parametric space. Um, and a lot of my work um, before this body of work has been, you know, parametric design using Grasshopper, using Rhino, using things that are um, utilizing these tools um, in more formal, more expressionistic ways. Um, but for this, I really wanted to, to uh, tease out something different, tease out something different about that process of making. And so um, I've lately been engaging with um, new processes of mark making, uh, specifically in the virtual space. Um, so I'm engaging with um, Tilt Brush, which is a, a VR painting program, um, and building some tools in there that allow us to transfer the mark making that we make with our bodies every day um, into uh, physical artifacts. And I think my, my interest with this body of work is in teasing out the imperceptible differences that um, even though we do something over and over and over and over again until we don't do it anymore, um, Every single, every single time is different. And so this, this work is just very, very simple motions. Um, no piece here took more than like 20 seconds to make um, in, in, digi in the digital world. But I mean, that's like, it's a whole nother thing translating that. And um, this is a simple, this, this gesture is just me standing and just drawing a line. It's a really long, simple line. And then going back and doing the same thing again. And in our heads, we would perceive that as two straight lines. We, we think our bodies are absolute. We think our bodies can rep are repetitive, but um, even something that is so uh, simple and so um, uh, designed and controlled is completely different. And um, when you step into an environment that you're being read by, the mach by a machine that is cataloging every movement, every Cartesian point, um, you see how different everything is and every motion and every interaction is a different thing. And so this, this body of work is about teasing out um, the, these human parts using machines. Um, and yeah, they're all, they're all large 3D printed things with uh, hand painted, uh, hand finished. Um, so yeah. We, he had done some work using, uh, doing some text based stuff about a year ago we saw mm -hmm. it and it was pretty fascinating. It's, all, it's like hand calligraphy, digital graffiti, <laughs> 3D printed objects. Um, and then he, he worked it into a panel and turned it into kind of a painting. And I don't know, I thought it was, thought it was really fascinating. It was like bringing this humanity back to Process. Yeah, I think. I mean, the process is. Um, I'm. I'm so interested by this. This method of mark making and, and translation and how this idea of I. I feel like this letter form is going to do this, like the this A mm -hmm. or this I. Um, and then when I do it, it's like that's not actually like that's not what I thought it was. <laughs> um, it's both three dimensionally transformed and. Um, just this, uh, it's a it's a different aesthetic. Especially when you're um, working in VR space where there's no page. 
there's not, there isn't that tactile stick to a piece of paper um, and a medium that, that you're having a conversation with. It's another it's more spatial medium. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they're, they're drawn in VR and then translated out um, into three-dimensional objects, sliced up, and then 3D printed, reassembled, um, and then, uh, you know, painted and finished forever. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah. That that's part like, hasn't changed much. Yeah. yeah. 15, 15 seconds of uh, art and 15 days of yeah. uh, <laughs> sanding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So do you have uh, a VR headset on while you do this? Are you seeing like a live feedback from drawing the lines? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've done it without it too. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, sort of playing with that um, translation of mediums. Um, like I have one back in the studio and um, the studio gets a lot of light. And so occasionally you'll get like this crazy glitch yeah. um, from the IR tracking, yeah. like messing up, which yeah. is actually kind of nice. Yeah. Um, or like I run into my table and there's like a, <laughs> like a oh, fuck, like <laughs> crazy thing of like dropping a controller. Um, then that's all, those are fun moments. Yeah where the real world and the virtual world really collide. Um, and Literally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had to stop him probably. He was trying to stand and work on the table saw with the VR glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah. The finger representation's really good. In there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, they're really fascinating. And it's, um, they look, quote, handmade. Like, they are handmade. But and that's, that's what's yeah. interesting. Like, yeah. I'm, um, you know, I think it's, 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 <clears throat> Our perception of what is a handmade object versus what is a machined object um, is is this really fu funny thing, um, and I'm really interested in where um, that perception can start to break down. Where you can say, okay, it was made by a machine, but there's some hand there. Um, it, it's catching the the perfection of the machine and the imperfection of of hand. They're optimistic to me, and that's you know people are afraid of the future and technology and what are we doing with it and where are we going with it. Doesn't, this doesn't scare me. This is like a happy gestural form uh, with the humanity put back into it. Mm -hmm. cool. is, is the thickness changing here? What, it, what does that signify? Yeah, anything having to do with movement um, or? It's yeah. You're controlling, so you can do like a fade in. Um, okay. It's it's mostly with like speed and just pressure. Got it. Um, so there is there's a lot of so there's of actual you're, you're, there's real feedback to you moving. The way you're moving, the speed, the pressure you're it's, doing—it's controlled. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, yeah, I wanted this this piece. Um, I made a 40 foot long version of this um, where I was walking and scaling at the same time, and that one's really crazy. Um, but I, I think it's this one is is small, so it's controlled. But when you get into these larger things, it becomes much less controlled, and, yeah. and the feedback becomes a lot wilder. Yeah. Um, How many pieces is that? Put uh, that one? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Eight or something. Eight pieces, yeah. Okay. Eight I, different pieces. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> these these ones are the, this one and that one were way harder to put together than that one. Sure. That one's yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Smaller life size version. That was kind of fascinating. This well, the spear. Yeah. Which it was kind of fascinating. He drew this this line in space, and it was basically your full range mm -hmm. height. And yeah. then he 3D printed it, made it into this reality, and it was like the perfectly sized spear. You know what I mean? Spear, not spear. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, just when you held it and walked around with it, it was like, oh, that's meant to be in your hand. Because it was unique yeah. your proportions. Yeah, it's exactly, it's just exactly the the um, wingspan mm -hmm. um, of standing in one spot and making one line. Mm -hmm. oh, my All right. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I have uh, uh, three different kinds of pieces in the show. I have some prints on this wall and a print on the back wall. I have some uh, mosaics and cross stitch pieces on this wall and I have some books over there and uh, by the door. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the idea behind the different types of projects. Um, but they all kind of, the thread that pulls them all together is basically the, what the basics of this show is, is the, the conversation between um, the two worlds that we live in, which is the the virtual world on the computer and the physical world. And um, I was thinking about how I'm, I'm sure like a lot of you, I spend a huge amount of every day staring at a computer screen and uh, I'm interested in the way that the, the two worlds, the virtual world and the physical world kind of interact, how they reflect each other and also how they infect each other. And um, so, um, 
the, the seed for the prints is really um, the idea of the page. I do a lot of letterpress printing, which with physical pages. Um, and um, as you know, on the computer, um, a lot of the content on computers and on the internet is organized around the, the metaphor of the page. And um, I started seeing things um, in the computer world that we, uh, like um, motifs and shortcuts and things that we just kind of take for granted on the virtual page. And was thinking if I move some of these things out to the physical page, they would seem kind of crazy, um, even surreal. So you have a message like, you are not authorized to view this page, but I am viewing this page. You know? <laughs> Um, and I have, there's a, a map print over there, and we're all used to having um, uh, a Google map kind of half download on our smartphone. <laughs> but if you went to AAA and they gave you a printed map like that, you'd be like, what the hell is this? You know, so, so that was kind of the idea behind these. The, um, the idea behind the, the, the mosaic pieces and the, um, the uh, cross-stitch pieces is, um, I also do a lot of, it, they're about the way that computers make images, the way that they display images. So I do all my work, I do a lot of work um, where I'm doctoring images. I'm, I'm either combining them together or I'm making things disappear or stuff. Um, and takes a lot of close in detail look at the images. And it's interesting that when you look at a high def image on your screen of a, of a mountainscape or a cloudscape, that when you, when you go in super, super close, uh, those smooth curves, you realize they're just little squares of color. And so even though the computer is this whole new thing, it's actually in the continuum of human history, the way we've made images for thousands of years with little blocks of color, whether they're tiles or stitches of thread and pixels. And the, the big difference is, is resolution. My, Mosaics are maybe two tiles per inch, where your t your computer screen is 72 per inch. Um, and um, interesting sidebar: the one over there that kind of looks like a blocky circle. Another way of expressing resolution is distance. If you got back far enough mm -hmm. from that, it would look like a very smooth circle. Mm -hmm. if you, were, you know, if maybe you could see it from across the street through the window or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so, and then um, I have uh, four books uh, over there. These and. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll talk about that one last. Uh, okay. the, the two, uh, HTML and uh, the hacked, those ones are kind of also playing off the idea of the page. So the HTML one, uh, the pages on a computer, they are um, they're a mirage. There's no real page. It's just some code that's telling the computer how to display the content. So I thought it'd be interesting if you did a book that had pages and behind every page was the HTML code that explained what was on the front of the page. And then the hacked one is that, you know, you get your website hacked and what if you had a book like that that was hacked and had no content, it'd be pretty sad. <laughs> and it's a, it's a pretty sad book. Um, so, <laughs> um, the other two are, um, there's a, this hardcover book here called A Book, um, and then there's a magazine called The Magazine, and they're kind of about a, um, an attitude or kind of a, um, um, a, a, that you see a lot in the tech community, that's the sense that everything should be on the internet, <laughs> everything should be on the cloud. And um, so I have this, this, and it's, things should be in the cloud because either it's more cost effective, which sometimes it is, or it's more accessible, which sometimes it is, but there's this kind of belief that it's just better if it's in the cloud, you know? <laughs> so I have this book, that's you hold in your hand and it says if you'd like to know more about this book go to www.abook.com and you think well but I have it right here why can't I just look at it then you go no no you don't understand it's in the cloud it's better it's better in the cloud so you kind of can see where that attitude goes I mean uh, maybe in the near future there'll be a uh, uh, a poster in a restaurant that says, uh, in case of choking, go to www.heimlich.com and watch this short video on how to save a life, which means the choking victim is dead by that point, you know, and if you have a fire in your, in your uh, kitchen, Alexa is not going to help you put it out. You want to have a fire extinguisher. So I, I, I think there are still things that um, we need to keep in the physical world 
Um, now that might be my advanced age talking, <laughs> <laughs> my old fartism, but uh, there you go. There yeah, you have it. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll hand you your letter, you're right. Yeah. Most of that's a lot of it's handset. Old right. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of. Um, it's. On the one hand, it's kind of. Um, uh, it's absurd to like go to that extent to print something that you could just print on a laser printer. But I guess on the other hand, you kind of hope that maybe it makes it a little bit more interesting. It's like the difference between you could buy um, a Hostess cupcake at the store, or you could actually make a cupcake, and the one you make is probably you think a little nicer. So, <laughs> yeah, so. And you notice he did the "I am not a robot" print as well, which actually was your idea for the title of the show. Right. We're yeah. About. Yeah. Uh, just trying to think of something that would kind of tie together the idea of that. You know. I'm in the virtual world, but I'm also I'm I'm not a robot. I'm a I'm a I'm a real person in the physical world, and you know you kind of get asked that continuously to try to determine are you, when online are you really a person or are you yeah. a robot and stuff. So you check the box, you guys. Right. Mm -hmm. It's even more absurd when you're at a, um, you're buying an item. Maybe it's a car or something like that. They, they print out the document online, and there's a box where you have to check it in person. I'm not a robot. Right, <laughs> that's right. There was a guy who had to do that. Yeah. He went to get his, <laughs> his car. Yeah, it's a little scary. Yeah. You usually have to jump through some kind of hoop. There's a test. Yes, you have to. Yeah, tell us where all the <laughs> click on all the right. <laughs> click on all the street signs or click on all that. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, the show is a, it's an interesting example of keeping our curation kind of open and not trying to control everything throughout the year. And I don't know, we, this was planned a year out, but it was it just kind of happened. I think it was really interesting. It was like meeting you guys and knowing your work, and uh, it all kind of came to fruition together nicely. I think. So, there's, there's lots of fun. You guys have any questions or any thoughts? I do. Yeah. It, see, it, it occurs to me that this <coughs> linear sculpture that's been virtually created is actually a recording and not really a sculpture. It's as much a recording as a sculpture at this point because when you remove, when you, remove you have one more dimension <coughs> of, of, um, of medium, which in this case I think would be the resistive surface. Mm -hmm. You actually liberate all your movements the ones you have control with and the ones you don't have control with. And I see tremors going across the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, so you're that the investigation of mark making and, and um, I mean, going back to the re recapture thing, mm -hmm. like the way the new ones work is they 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 do mouse tracking. So if you're in Chrome, mm -hmm. um, and it's tracking your mouse constantly, and it can tell if you're a robot or not based on how you move your mouse. Yeah. But that'll um, only work for a while, right? And then it, they'll they'll learn how to make a robot that will move. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's kind of um, that that same sort of thing though, right, where right. Um, and, and that. When we had the title of the show, it was very apropos. To, um, so, uh, wait a minute. You're telling me that if I use Google Chrome, I'm being tracked all the time. Everything I do. <laughs> are you are you uh, giving away yeah. some secrets now? Or no? Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that's a secret. Okay. <laughs> so, now, does this happen in Explorer? Nobody uses Explorer. So, but would I be safe in Explorer? Yeah. I think it's it's uh, it's always a question, right? Yeah. Like with the, back to the question of recording, right? Is you. Um, whether any sort of interface with any sort of technology, it's asking for your information. It's asking for you to input something in exchange for um, something out. Um, and uh, a lot of those times, those inputs are not perceptible or not realized or um, are ephemeral. Um, and uh, it's interesting that these works are trying to make those, those, um, those inputs very, very real, very valid. <laughs> it's a good point. It's a recording. I mean, you can never reproduce this. No. no. I mean, it's a Polaroid. Like, yeah, it's no. it's a snapshot of no. a motion of an image, right. um, and it only yeah. ever happens once. I made like forty of these, and each one has each one is different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so you could print copies of that one again. I mean, you do have, right? Oh, if I really wanted to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I if we can create multiples of them. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, it could be additions. Yeah. It's a plastic. It's a thermoplastic. Yeah, it's a, it's an acrylic like plastic. Three D printed, right? Uh -huh. 3D yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Painted and yeah. 
But I think that's, yeah, I think all of us sort of, you know, none of these things are right off the machines. Right. Like, there's a lot of manual work and manual craft that goes into um, what comes right off the machine. Just, just like, I mean, just with, with printmaking, mm -hmm. with 3D printing, with laser cutting, with machining, anything, it's like, what you get off right off the machines is generally crap. Yeah. Um, right. And then there's a lot of finesse that goes into it to um, get it to somewhere that it can be talked about as, a, as an art object. Yep. Um, a lot of sanding. Yeah, it's a lot of sand. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not for Tom. So yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, no sanding was done in yeah. my work at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is, it's also, it's nice in, you know, it's, uh, so much of my work is just making stuff in the digital world, which just doesn't exist anywhere, you know, and uh, I have videos I made that can't, be played on anything anymore. Mm -hmm. I have all these things that I, all these years of work that I have really nothing to show for it. And so it's nice to, you know, make a print and at the end of the day you actually have something that you made, you know, in the, in the physical world, which is a big, a nice thing nowadays. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a big part of the, of the first work I did that was along these lines t several years ago, um, the, what I was trying to do was bring something ephemeral, like a, like a film, like a moving image, and make it uh, make it physical. So the, bringing some kind of permanence to that, and it kind of it came from this. I, I had you know um, art galleries would want to to use some of my media stuff and project it on the walls, and and I, I always thought that was kind of dumb because you could just watch it on YouTube. Like why do you need to? So we can all stand around with wine glasses and look at a thing. Like I don't know. It, it just. I was trying to find a way to make the, make make something ephemeral, and I do I love film and you know movies and moving images and stuff, but to make that something that's that's physical and special and um, and uh, a one off, you know, like that's that's kind of another part of that idea, I think. For yeah, it sounds like for all of us. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Got some pretty interesting people here. <laughs> <laughs> You guys work in this realm a lot. Um, it's kind of interesting. What do you, not to be too contrived, but okay, 50 years from now, what would this art show look like and what kind of tools would you be using? Um, as far as digital fabrication yeah. um, and art, how about that? Anything there? <laughs> Let's get a little sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, Let's bring it. The, the line between robot and human becomes a lot closer. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, the ideas of single materials, of non-active materials, yeah. of things that are just, that are, uh, this will be, these, these bodies would be closer to skin than they would be to wood mm -hmm. um, at, this, at that point. Um, in terms of their sensorial abilities, in terms of their complexity, in terms of, um, yeah, their intelligence. It's mm -hmm. closer closer to a living thing mm -hmm. than um, a piece of wood. Sure, yeah. just through sensory, just yeah. more and more complex communication and sensors. And I think, yeah, like, the more intera and, and interactive, I think you're, John, you're like, really playing with this idea of, of interaction and playfulness and um, in, engagement mm -hmm. with the, the viewer. And I think um, that sort of interactivity is what, in 50 years, like immersion on dimensions that are not typically, or that are not available to us right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think Performances too. I think like mm -hmm. performance is going to be a, a big part of it. I think you're going to see uh, much more uh, things are going to react more to to people. I mean, when you're, you're you're going to have a you're going to have emotional relationships with with machines in a way that you don't now. And it's it's already starting to happen. But sure. fifty years from now, yeah, it's, there's there will be people that you know prefer the company of machines. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll be one of them. But. <laughs> I, th I think also the thing that's hard to predict is how how the machines that we have now, how they will be used in 50 years. Because you yeah. think about letterpress as an example of that mm -hmm. is that, now that's a technology that's 100 years old, at least in terms of 50 years, 60 mm -hmm. years old in terms of when people stopped using sure. it as a real thing. And at the time when people used to do letterpress as, as part of a, their business, the idea was, 
to the, a, a good printer would not show any impression yeah. at all on the page yeah. because you would have to put things on the front and the back and you were just supposed to, the ink and the type were just supposed to kiss the page. Mm -hmm. But now where we no longer need that technology, all of a sudden the printing press becomes this interesting thing that can, people now they want to pound the hell out of the page because you can leave an impression. You can't mm -hmm. do that on your, on your laser printer. You can't do that on your, sure. on your printer. So mm -hmm. the way that people use that technology has changed that you wouldn't necessarily have known. And I think that may be the same for a lot of these things that we're seeing now. 50 years, they'll be used in a way that we didn't even intend or a different sure. way. Or, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, th I think Brian and I are kind of already doing that also because the machines we use to make these the things that we both made, uh, or they were designed for prototyping. So it was a way to, to get a, a quick copy of, of the thing that you were gonna get manufactured into the yeah. really complicated process. Mm -hmm. And we're we're both using them to make the final product, which is you know that's that's not really how they were how they were intended, you know. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> well, nobody has any questions or thoughts. We're still open for yeah. What's up? I really appreciate the curatorial process of bringing these three together. In the sense, all of your work has to do with archiving archiving history, machines archiving and action, using technology, Tom, um, archiving um, um, messages from the new mm -hmm. in history of, of the old. I, I also really just love how um, all of the works kind of throw a wrench into um, what art and beauty is. Meaning, I could have come to this work and find beauty not knowing anything about it. Likewise, I could have gone down the path of, of machine worlds. Mm -hmm. And likewise, I can chuckle at my own world mm -hmm. of uh, being trapped. Mm -hmm. um, you started the presentation by phrasing, you know, what is reality? Mm -hmm. So I might pose that right back to the three artists. Um, what is each of your work trying to say, mm -hmm. or could it be saying, about our, our current reality? Um, and I'll leave it at that. I'll keep it open for the purpose of just allowing you to run with it. Yeah, yeah, I, that's, um, I love that question. Uh, it, we, we don't have a reality without technology. Like, human beings are absolutely not only dependent on it, but defined by it. Like language is a technology, right? D writing, the, the, ev everything. We can't, we can't survive without technology for more than like a day, maybe two, you know. Um, in California, maybe a week. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, it also becomes, there, there's a point where we don't, we can't tell ourselves from our technology. We, we get, that, that line gets so blurred that you, you think of yourself as this thing with clothes on that gets in a car that does it, does these things and you know interacts with the world in a certain way um, and that's you 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 don't you don't even think of it as something separate from yourself and I think now um, you know as you can see with Tom's stuff here it's it's a uh, that that line's becoming blurrier and blurrier because now you're starting to have you know real relationships and connections with people that's that are so completely mediated by technology that you've never even seen the person before you've never even had a conversation in, in real life um, yeah, I, th I think uh, it's the stuff. The stuff I'm doing here. I think what I'm interested in is is that I'm bringing bringing attention back to that, to this idea that the things that, that are you just you don't even think about. They're just part of you as much as your hand is or something. Are actually very complex and and something that, that you know do, that actually requires some some attention. Oh, me. Uh, sure. Yeah. No. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know. I would say, um, in a way, um, especially, it's kind of like just trying to say, um, take a little piece of control, you know, that um, I have some say in this too, you know, that it's not the computer has to tell me all the time the way I'm supposed to do things or what I'm supposed to think and stuff, that it's to say like, no, I think this is kind of weird, or this is kind of, uh, you know, to taking a little bit more control back and say I have my own ideas about things. So, 
Um, um, but then also, like with the Prince, or to also see that, um, you know, you, you get, there's a lot of hype around computers like this is like nothing we've ever had. And it's true. And yet at the same time, it's a continuum along with things of what humans have done for thousands of years. Um, and it's connected to that. It's not a, a break and it's a whole new thing necessarily. It's, it's a continuation and, and it's part of the progress and the, that we've gone through. It's a nice anyway. point. No, it's um, all of the work is in a way, like, you know, like a little subversive, like in a playful way. Like a little bit of a pushback, but playing with it. You know, not being controlled by technology, but um, playing with it and kind of joking with it. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, this question of reality uh, is one I think about a lot. Um, and I think as a, as a designer, as an artist, as um, somebody who's always thinking about what could be um, or what is and how do we respond to it, um, I feel like I constantly live in a dream world. Um, I, I, the, my grasp of reality is not uh, necessarily real. Um, and, um, you got here on time, though. Yeah. You made it here on time. <laughs> a couple minutes yeah. to spare. <laughs> Um, I mean, but, the, but that's the thing, like, like um, you know, uh, reality is so constructed, like, um, this idea of what I perceive as real um, is something that I'm constantly trying to tease out, um, and, you know, my body showed up here at, right. at four o'clock on time. I don't know um, where your mind is. But, yeah, and it's like, you know, you I'm in some point. other place, um, and I think when doing things like this, doing things like... Uh, incorporating the body and incorporating intentionality and mark making um, allows sort of those um, connections between a perceived reality and um, what we would generally consider reality, which is the interaction of bodies and space and form and dust. Um, That's why I was yeah. trying to always refer to it as the virtual world and the physical world, because the re what is real is different for everybody. I mean, the physical world, you are actually, I'm sitting on a chair. I mean, I can't contest that, you know, my body's here on the chair. So, and the, and the virtual world is there, but the rea in terms of reality is, that's where everything gets fuzzy in terms mm -hmm. of what's, what's the reality is different for everybody. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, when, uh, well, as we're making things, we're always teasing those realities right, right. Um, and pushing those realities and, right. and imagining things that are not real right. um, and then realize, right. realizing mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and like reality is so fluid yeah. uh, in, yeah. in that sense between that the line between idea, perception, realization. Right. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. Um, that's, that's making art. Yeah. I think in particular, I mean, you all work in the arts. Um, you guys are basically your day job is being paid to kind of push that envelope, right? Yeah. Pretty much. What can I do with this? And, yeah. yeah. And don't you, you do some residency programs and you invite artists in to facilitate some? I th yeah, that's kind of, I mean, that's sort of that one of the reasons that I um, still try to make art as much as I can. Um, is uh, it allows it art asks questions of technology that um, engineers and designers aren't asking yet. Um, when you when you engage with um, engage with processes that are not necessarily useful but are um, able to be realized some, in something else, it it allows us to ask questions and realize new methods, new techniques, new technologies that eventually will get rolled into products. And I mean, there's there's a huge precedence of like Xerox Park and and Bell Labs and you know Autodesk has, has this amazing residency and Facebook's residency that um, companies uh, engaging with creativity um, to help foster uh, technology and ideas eventually. Um, and I, I think that's a, it's an important part of um, where the current moment um, is. I, I hope that um, you know, more, more people working in technology and more people that work for technology companies um, can engage with that um, and, and sort of form this new model of patronage um, for, for creative visions. I don't know if that, that didn't really answer the question at all, but... Um, no, you, because yeah. you're, the developers, engineers of technology aren't, they're not PCs anymore, you know, they're not, it's just not all boring line code, it's really trying to 
uh, touch base with what it really is to be a human, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if, if we're designing machine intelligence, uh -huh. like we have to know what human intelligence is. Yeah. Like, if we want machines to interact mm -hmm. with us mm -hmm. in a way that we want, mm -hmm. we need to teach them, and we so that means that engineers need to know what humans are, um, exactly. and that's um, that's an important thing. Way more friendly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have a little bit of a follow-up question. Yeah. Here. Yeah. I, and I don't know how to ask it quite yet, but you both work for big companies that produce this technology. And I'm wondering, you stand a bit in front of that technology as represent, uh, uh, representatives of the technology. And I, I wonder what you see your responsibility is and to whom as artists. Um, as an artist, I, I, I don't, I don't see that I so much have a responsibility for anything but making, making things that I'm interested in. I, I think that's, that's as far as it goes for me. I, I can't speak for, for anyone else here. But, but you mentioned you were a content creator for, for Autodesk, and so is, is this content, is, it, is, is, is there some responsibility of this to reflect yeah. Autodesk, or is, it, is there also a responsibility for you as an artist to give knowledge to other artists, say, hey, look what you can Absolutely. do. Absolutely. How do you position yourself in that world? I see what you mean. Market and creativity. Yeah, so, so these, these machines, actually all the machines here, that one will soon be there as well. They're all, all these things are on Instructables, which is a, um, it's an online DIY community. So anybody can go on there and put up a project they've done, explain what they did, and then anyone else can engage in it. So all of these are, um, the, 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 the purpose of them in terms of content is to show people how you can do these things and put it out there for free. So I'm freely giving away, this is how I made this thing, this is how these, these parts work, here's how you can do this, um, here's the free software to make the things. Um, yeah, in terms of responsibility, it's spreading the, 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 um, uh, the, the tools and the knowledge to make things as far as, as possible to as many people as possible. To, to democratize that to an extent that it's it's not that almost anybody can do it. That's that yeah for sure. That's that's the big idea for me. Is, is that responsibility though? Here's the big question: Do you see that as a responsibility that you're giving to the artist or to the company? Because if you democratize it, then more people are going to buy or use the software. Sure. Or you would yeah, more yeah but if the software is the best software, then you know it's it's not. It, hopefully, it's mutually benefiting. It, it, right? Yeah, the company's going to profit if a. Because it's my understanding, Autos gives away software for free, except when you start making money. Except when you start making a lot of money, yeah. Then, then, then you have to find the right. So everybody benefits. It's like you get you get a bunch of people in in, in the beginning that are you know like, using the stuff and playing with it and learning with it, and then later on when they're when they have started their own thing and then then they're they're paying for it and then you know, everybody wins. Yeah. As opposed to Adobe products, where right? Where they're that's not there, or you might get a, a student version, but it's got a watermark on it, or you know stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there there's a responsibility. Like, if I'm saying I'm responsible to the company, um, then it's I'm responsible to push the envelope of this technology and record it so that it can be used at some point. Yeah. Um, but I think the the greater responsibility as an artist is to ask larger questions of this technology and what else it could be used for besides some freaking smartphone or something. Like, yeah. we don't need those. No, we, don't, we don't need more of those. Um, yeah. But the technology that we're exploring allows us to um, interact and have new th have new ways of exploring ourselves, um, and that hopefully uh, are good things. <laughs> um, and the, so the greater responsibility would be to make things that are more seductive than um, phones and uh, things that do harm um, to make something better uh, and, and develop things that are more seductive, more successful than um, things that are problematic. Um, helping, helping guide that. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just thinking about the, the, the three bodies of work and all of that is sort of expressing a, the incompleteness, the, the difference between what's stuck in the virtual world and where we're stuck in the, uh, in the physical world. Mm -hmm. And like Jonathan was saying about artifice and, and you know not being able to tell the difference between you know what's man-made around us we are so used to the environment we're in mm -hmm. but there's nothing natural about the environment
environment we're in. We've kind of co-evolved with the environment, and it's all normal and indistinguishable from us as we go through our day, our day to day. But um, with the virtual world, it hasn't sort of evolved to the point where it's so integrated yet. Maybe it's in the process, and all of these, each in their own way, are sort of commenting about how you bring the virtual into the physical and what the potential future for that might look like. And maybe that's your question about 50 years. Mm -hmm. 50 years hence is maybe we'll really have evolved to the point where they are indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, exactly. Integrated and we're used to it. Our kids, kids to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what will that look like? Exactly. Yeah. That's the well, thank Which you. doesn't even pose the question, is this a good thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the value is good. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> Well, it's, like, it's like asking if the weather is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it has both ways. But it's also different. I mean, you know, a hundred years ago, people didn't have cars and yeah. they were highways and stuff. And so that was like, that changed. And for us now, we just take for granted all that trick sure. stuff. So the mm -hmm. same thing is going to happen. Yeah. There's um, always been a big fear of the new technology, whether yeah, it be yeah. radio. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there, there's always there's always positives Oops. and minuses all the time. Yeah, you're always you're always getting gaining and losing yeah. with everything all the time. So. There's always unintended consequences. Absolutely, so. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And there are benefits well. that you didn't um, anticipate also. Yeah. So that that's the thing, and you, you don't know, and that's. Um, and that's like with the the hardcover book where he's got talking about, you know, trying to maybe think about the decision is like, well, okay, does everything go into the virtual world? It's like, no, there are some things that need to stay in the physical world, so, but we kind of have to think about that. What are the things you want to keep, that you need to keep in the physical world, and what are the things that can be yeah. in the virtual world? Yeah. And how can, these, how, how can this technology help us keep things in the virtual world and you know, put right. the things there that need to be there? Right. Yeah. Or to keep things out of the physical world. <laughs> like, yeah, I think we, really, we really need to break out the wine right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really deep, very deep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Really interesting.